Hello, hello, everybody. Dude, <laughs> Dude, you're breaking the law. What the heck? Where's your mask? I know, I know. I don't have my mask oh. on. I am, uh, this is this is what you got here. You get fair and balanced news coverage uh, with the think and grow, not think and grow, build and grow with real estate. I'm so used to think and grow right uh, with the Build and Grow with Real Estate uh, show every day at noon, except for when I'm out uh, showing houses. Uh, so uh, we are at one o'clock today. We are coming to you from the Real Estate Hackers Network. And our goal is to educate people and help them raise their brand and raise okay. their level when it comes to real estate. My name is Judah Hoover. I'm an executive with Slate House Group. We are a modern real estate company. Um, and our focus is on helping people invest in more real estate. Our focus is helping you buy or list or sell your own primary residence. Right now, the world needs more sellers. If you have any inclination to sell right now, I got to tell you, you're probably going to get 15 to 20% more for your house than what you think you are. Now is an awesome, awesome time to think about listing your house. And I would love to talk with you about that. Awesome. Um, my name is Josh Weidman. I am a real estate investor and hard money lender right here in central Pennsylvania. Uh, hard money bankers is a, um, we've got a bunch of branches um, all over the, the Northeast. We uh, currently are lending in Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Delaware, Maryland, Northern Virginia, and DC. If you're looking for your, uh, to fund your next project, um, we are a direct lender, which means that we can underwrite and approve your loan on the same day you contact us. If all the title work is done and everything's ready to go, we can fund on the, uh, you know, within 24 hours. So, um, you know, give me a call if you're interested in funding your next project, 717-213-8488. Holy mackerel, Judah. There's so much. How are we going to get through this in half an hour? I'm I'm, I'm not sure. This is going to be. This is, <laughs> right. So I, I, I'm a big fan of talk radio. Um, I love, you know, Rush Limbaugh and Hannity, all those guys, but I also, I listen to just as much, if not more NPR. And I just, I love thoughtful commentary and things like that. And now I understand why they say, you know, always have more show prep than what you need because it just makes for such a great, great show. We've got tons of content cooking up on the mm -hmm. content grill today, Josh. So where are we starting? I, I'm gonna I'm gonna throw out some breaking news. Um, Ghislaine Maxwell, uh, Jeff Epstein's associate. We'll call her associate. Wh whatever. She she was responsible for recruiting a lot of the a lot of the girls that he abused and molested. Uh, she was arrested this morning by the FBI in New Hampshire at 8:30 this morning. That is good news for the good guys. Hooray! Hooray! Absolutely. Oh, um, other people are opposed to. Um, you know, human trafficking and things like that. So that is uh, that is a very good thing. What's yeah. the over under or uh, until the Clintons kill her? Um, oh, yeah, I think she's already dead. I mean, <laughs> her obituary was was published last night. Right. <laughs> Scary anyway. stuff. Yeah. So, um, all right. So let's remember when that was like the worst thing going on in the world, like joking around about did the Clintons kill these people or not? Which, by right. the way. Like, I love being super skeptical about government and left-leaning government, especially and everything like that. I think it's funny to joke around about the Clintons. I actually don't think that they, you know, are, are behind any of this or anything like that. But you do you disagree? Remember, you disagree? Well, <laughs> I imagine disagree. that. I'm 100%. Like, I'm 100% they've killed people. I'm sorry. Really? I, I said it. I, it look. It is I, I politely, I politely disagree. The point is, do you remember when that was the biggest controversies we had? As we were, oh, yeah, I know. All right, so yeah, that's that. But the good news is, score one uh, for the for the good guys on on uh, on bringing to justice somebody who helped perpetrate a huge uh, pedophile ring. Right. Um, one, Mark Zuck yeah. is the man. Oh my gosh! So Mark Zuckerberg. Hey, kudos. Like we're, we're broadcasted on Facebook. It's a great platform. Um, you know, it's really developed into a, a large part of our society. Um, yes. And, you know, there's been a lot of pressure, political pressure, um, social pressure on these social media platforms to start curtailing the speech of, um, of the people that are posting. And you know what? 
I got to give it to Mark Zuckerberger. I, I didn't realize that he was such a beast. Zuckerberger or just Zuckerberg? I don't yeah. know. We'll See, about. thanks, we'll Taz. Talk. Thanks, Taz. Appreciate it. Taz got you. It's just, I think it's just Zuckerberg. I don't think there's another ER there on the end of that. We're calling him Zucks. That's it. But right. He's a man of the week this week. Zuck said. Didn't bow to pressure. He lost. So, so what happened? So what happened with Zuck is there was a number of people, uh, organizations who were pulling ads, um, and Zuck was able to look and say, you know what, my top 100 advertisers combined only add up to six percent of my advertising revenue. Yep. They're also not doing anything for. They're not pulling anything from other uh, properties that I own like uh, Instagram. And so therefore he felt really confident about what was going on. And as long as there, everyone needs to read the book long tail, Chad recommended that book for me. It's awesome. And there's so much money in the long tail from all of the little advertisers. And yeah. I mean, Zuck has been doing a lot of really good stuff and he's been, he's been pulling down, you know, a lot of hate speech and stuff that's actually hate speech, but he's also been saying like, I'm not getting, into the political fray. And here's the thing that bothers me about the virtue signaling that's going on. Yep. All of the companies that want Zuckerberg to be more politically active are also doing business with China. <laughs> you can't hate Zuckerberg and love China at the same time. That's, I mean, I mean, not and be intellectually honest. Let's put it that way. And I, the thing that I love is that it's cost him billions personally right. in stock value. It's cost his company like fifty-two billion or fifty-four billion in in um, in market market value. But here's the thing: he looks at it long term and he says, "Look, they're going to come back." The they're revenue gonna... didn't really go down that much. A lot of the companies that pulled their ads only pulled U.S. ads. So, yeah. that, so that they wouldn't be seen advertising in the U.S. They didn't yeah. actually want to pull away from Facebook. They wanted people to think that they were pulling away from Facebook because it really is just – it really is about the money for them. It's, yeah. oh, okay, I can appease the mob by not advertising on Facebook, and that makes good dollars and cents. I can also do business with China when there are flagrant human rights violations – because that also makes dollars and cents. So yeah. what seems like intellectual dishonesty is really just baseline purity, love of money, love of capitalism, which is funny because it's coming from people who otherwise would tell you that capitalism isn't a great thing. Well, and, and think about this. It's not like Facebook is this huge philanthropist company that you know people are just sending them money for no reason. Right. They're paying for eyeballs. That's right. the whole point. And right. and so if they're not like if they're not getting the return on their their investment, then they're not going to show up. But they are, and so they're they're making a big move, a big show to say, hey, we're behind all of the stuff that's going on, and give it a month or two, they'll be back. Yep, absolutely. All right, moving yeah. on. Pennsylvania Supreme Court, dude, oh, good buddy. Let's keep on rocking. No, five no, to two no. decision. Five to two decision stating that um, the the legislature can't. Pull um, a an individual uh, what, so, emergency declaration. Yeah. So here's here's the deal. The the whole legislature. We had um, you know we had a guest on that um, uh, that th my goodness I'm losing my, my mind. My boy Matt Ballas. My boy Matt Ballas. Yeah. Matt Ballas was on here a couple weeks ago talking about this legislation. Basically, what happened was when the emergency powers the governor took or the governor took the emergency powers. And the legislature legislature voted for it. Well, the law dictates that the governor has to end the period of emergency that these emergency powers. Well, the legislature said, "Hey, look, this is not fair. This is not realistic. There's no checks and balances of power. This can go on forever and ever and ever." And so, what they did was they passed a resolution that said, "We're ending. We're revoking our emergency powers that we offered the governor." And now this is all over. But it went to the state Supreme Court. Supreme Court said, nope, you're wrong. Five to two. That's not a yeah. narrow decision. What, what's really interesting, though, is the dissenting opinion on this case. Um, I forget the uh, who the, um, the judge was that wrote it. But his point was that, look, the whole intent here of government and having three different um, portions of the government is these checks and balances. Well, 
in emergency powers, there really should be some kind of check and balance here. And so because there's not, I'm voting against this, even though per the law and per the uh, you know pre-existing court cases, the governor's right. He has the ability to just continue this as long as it goes. He has to sign off on uh, on the end to these the emergency. I mean, but ultimately, you know, we as the people get the we as people get the government we deserve. Yep. And um, if Wolf and the Democrats pay no political price for this, then great. If uh, the if Wolf and the Democrats pay a political price for this, then great. Here's what you need to remember: the people were self quarantining long before the government said you must stay at home. People yep. were working from home. Schools were shutting down because school bo- school boards that answer much more closely to a smaller group of, of voters than what um, uh, than what uh, you know state and national figures do. So the people led into uh, the shutdown. The people also led out of the shutdown and said, you know what, uh, you're not going to arrest us all, and I'm really not worried about this or. Like like what I did, you know what? I'm going to go out a little bit more, but I'm also going to wear a mask just because I don't want to fight the fight and, and things like that. You know, I think there's big jerks on both sides. So the people are what's leading this. And we we just as a society have to stop looking to government to solve these problems. So am I d- disappointed with the Supreme Court? Yeah. Um, do I think that the Supreme Court of Pennsylvania and the Supreme Court of the nation are both acting like a legislature? Like the Supreme Court's supposed to be, you know, cut, yeah. like they're supposed to look at what does the text say and go from there. And but that's those, what they did here. That's what they did here. And in this case, that's what they did. I mean, and and sorry, Jude, I don't mean to cut you off here, but I I disagree on this. I think that their ruling was wrong. I I disagree with what they're saying. We get this graphic just to oh be, you know God. how we have like like and comment over here, mm-hmm. and we have the uh, grow, think and grow, or build and grow with real estate up here. I think we should just have like a I one hundred percent agree with Judah <laughs> graphic. Just you that just keep, keep that the time. I mean, for oh, nothing God. more than my shallow, uh, fragile self worth and and extreme vanity. I mean. All right. So let me rephrase this. The reason that I agree with this ruling is because it adheres to the law as it's written. And I really like having a written law and then everybody following those rules. Right. I mean, I'm I'm all for that. On the flip side, I hate the law. I think it's it's ridiculous. It needs to be written. I I don't know. I mean, I, I, my understanding is, you know, once the governor acknowledges it, like, that it that it then goes away well that that just that doesn't make any sense the way the law is written if yeah. it, it can't mean what they are saying that it means because then cuz basically it's like saying to your kids when you give your t- kids a timeout and they agree that you've given them a timeout that's when the timeout begins right the kids just never agree to the timeout i'm going to give you a flip side a flip side argument on this right when was the last time we had an emergency powers or like an emergency a state of emergency declared on something like this? It's never happened before, not in recent history. The problem is, is it's only we're I, setting I, precedent that it's going to happen moving forward. Before, before you know, um, the before the Great Recession or the Great Depression and before like 1972 with Agnes and stuff like that, the question was, wasn't. The question was, should the government get involved in this hurricane in Galveston or should the government get involved in the San Francisco fire or should the government get involved? Now, whenever there's a national disaster, the question is, what should the federal government do? I I get that. Here's what here's my point on this, though. We can always change the law. Once this is done, we can change the law. But right now we can't change the law because we're in the middle of it. It's changing right. the rules in the middle of the game, and I get the reason that this th- that this vote happened. One hundred percent. That's why I said is, is either there is a political price to pay for this, or there isn't a political price to pay yeah. for this, and that is just like just. I mean, geez. I I mean I think the South is traitorous. I do not think we should support slavery or anything like that. I would be fine with all those statues statues being torn down. If the people in the area voted for it and decided to pull them down, I don't believe that we should have a mob rule. You know what I mean? Like, I believe that there should be a political 
clearing Clearing. process. So I think the same thing with this law. If we did, if the people of Pennsylvania decide to let this law stand, great. If the people of Pennsylvania decide not to let this law stand, great. Here, I'm just going to say this. I'm just going to say this and let people do some do some um, uh, research. If you want to know how racist those statues really are, ask yourself why there's no statues of Longstreet. Dude, we're going to we're going to leave that there to cut research. Why in the South? We're talking about Stonewall Jackson, Lee and Jefferson Davis. But no one ever talks about pulling down any statues of Longstreet, who was the number two dude. He was like he was like, you know, he was he was, uh, you know, the number two dude. Um, and, and there should be a lot of statues of Longstreet in the South if it really was about heritage and it really was about good military leadership. But and there's a thought- reason why the, stat- why the South didn't erect any statues to Longstreet. I, and you thought my my comment on uh, on the Clinton assassinations were was controversial. <laughs> I'm, just, right. I'm just telling you. Look up, uh, dear listeners, look up Longstreet. All right. So look, one more on uh, piggybacking on this court case. So it's almost like the governor heard that he won this court case, and then called up. <laughs> Call up his people and we're like, yo, we have free reign to do whatever we want. So right. if you leave the house, you got to have a face mask on in Pennsylvania. Right. It's right. nuts. And and honestly, this might be the straw. Like I, people have gotten to the point where, you know, we're kind of sick and tired of this. Right? right. And we're willing to put up with it. We're to a certain extent, this might be the straw. Cause I, I told my wife, I'm going to the gym after this. When I go to the gym, I'm not wearing a mask in the gym. I'm just not. And they might ask me to leave and I might have to leave. But like, and that's the other thing you've got to be intellectually consistent about because a business has a right to say no shirt, no shoes, no service. Yep. A business has a right to say, if you're not wearing your mask, please leave. And I get that is a private right of, of, um, uh, what's we're going to talk about it tomorrow. Um, it's a property right. freedom Freedom of, uh, freedom of association. Okay. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Exactly. All right. So we, we, we cover the face mask stuff. It is what it is. Let's get into some housing. I mean, I don't want to, I don't want to harp on this too much because it's a lot of the numbers that we covered last week. Okay. Um, as far as like new home sales, existing home sales. We got to uh, start coming up with graphics. Cause when we say the pending home sale index rose by 44.3%, those, those words get lost on our, um, on our audience. But that is all you need to know is that's the highest increase since we started keeping track of the pending home sales index in yeah. 2001. So, right. so pending home sales, pending home sales is means properties that went under contract. Right. That we've had the largest spike month over month of, of homes going under contract since 2001. So that just means there's a bunch of pent up demand. There was a pent, bunch of pent up demand out there. And if you're thinking about listing, you need to list and call me, by the way. Is that so, still don't, uh, year over year, contract signed did fall by 5.1% because inventory is significantly limited and we're not back fully. It's just we're coming out of this very sharply. So this is what's really interesting is that who would have thought the the projections now are that the total number of home sales are going to be down about 10 percent in 2020. Year over year, we're going to sell we're going to sell 10 percent less houses in 2020 than we did in 2021 or 2019. Who would would think that 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 was even possible if you take out the spring market? You take out the spring market, the hottest market in housing is gone and we're only going to be down 10 percent. It's pretty amazing. Yeah. Um, projections for 2020 are uh, what 40 4.93 million um, new or existing home sales. Basically, five million. Just say five million. There we five go. Five million existing home sales. All seven hundred thousand new home sales. It's six hundred ninety yeah. k. So seven hundred thousand newly constructed, brand spanking new homes sold. 5 million existing homes, used homes. Don't call them used homes. Isn't that interesting? Uh, sold. Well, and and so um, I was reading something about the, from the National Association of Realtors. And their, I mean, their predictions are like awful. I didn't even write them down because they were so ridiculous for 2021. The bottom line here is that if you're flipping houses and you can find a good deal, 
the likelihood that your property is going to sell is like 99.9999999. You know, it is so it, it, nice houses. They call them like new. They're right. oh, they're in such high demand. The only thing that I warn people about is this, dude. And we're in central Pennsylvania and you came from Philadelphia and everything like that. I mean, I've done 600 flips and probably 20 or 30 of them were houses that I shouldn't have done because they were just funky. They were just that old farmhouse or that house that was just carved up weird or it was just, I mean, like anything will sell right now, but like, that doesn't mean you should buy anything. Like there's a lot of houses out there that just because it looks like a three bedroom, 1500 square foot house, it's so funky. It's not going to compare to others. So just be cautious on funky houses in central PA. How about this? I got a, uh, I, I did a, a flip on a house outside of, in a neighborhood outside of Philadelphia. Got a phenomenal deal on this property, right? Like killer deal. Start rehabbing it. Find there is a, there's no foundation. Literally no foundation on the property. It was so there can't be a bad foundation. On top of it. foundation. Well, and there was a structural crack inside one of the closets that you couldn't see until you demoed the house. Long story short, Ended up finishing the project. Didn't kill me, but almost. Um, right. But the, the the lesson learned, if I'd have ripped the house down, tore it down to the ground and built new construction, I'd have made tremendously more money because right. it was a great lot, great location. You know, just because there's a house there doesn't mean you have to keep it. <laughs> highest and best use. What right. is the highest and best use for this yep. plot of ground? Yeah, yep. absolutely. That's right. All right. Let's get into Fannie and Friday news. We got to keep on moving. Well, all right. So I want to go back here and talk about the, uh, actually, you're right. Fannie and, Fa- Fannie and Freddie announced this week that they are going to be offering an extension for landlords, um, for forbearance to landlords of another 90 days. Um, that's, that's pretty cool, but it's only for four plus units, you know, properties that have four plus units in them. And it's um, it, obviously non-owner occupied, yada, yada, yada. But the percentage of Fannie and Freddie backed loans of four plus unit homes is not very high. And so that's not such a great thing. But to make well, that worse, go ahead. 50% of Fannie and Freddie debt is on four plus unit homes. Okay. So, so, so here's I'm, what happens. Here's what happens with Fannie and Freddie. They right. write a lot of loans, zero to four units, yep. right? They write almost no loans, four units to 50 units or something like that. I mean, four units to 50 units, you've got to go to your local community bank. Right. Over 50 units, that's like those large apartment complexes, they're financed by Fannie and Freddie and it's non-recourse loans and it's 30 year fixed mortgages and stuff like that. So that might be- You guys get bailed out again. Yeah. Yeah. Because what they're trying to do is they're also trying to- they're hoping that if they offer forbearance on on that, then they can also offer payment plans and other things that they don't evict as many tenants. And therefore, there's not as many tenants that are clogging up homeless shelters and, you know, other needing other government services. So you, you hit the nail on the head. That forbearance, it's got strings, right? Oh, yeah. You cannot evict the tenant for right. non-payment of rent. If right. you accept the forbearance and you can't charge late fees for late payments, right. reasonable, I guess, but there's, uh, there's just like, there's Pennsylvania has, has a, has a uh, thing that's coming out, um, which I think like you can start signing up for it all July 10th. Um, and it, if you, if you will, if you're willing to accept $750 per door as 100% of the rent, they will guarantee you rent for you. But again, there's a bunch of strings that come along with it. Right, right. Um, all right. We were talking a little bit about the Fed. So right now, mortgage rates dropped again uh, to record lows, 2.94%, 30-year fixed mortgage rates. Unbelievable. Um, and it looks to stay there for a while. 
Judy, you started talking to me about the Fed before we jumped on the air. I, I mean, jump in here. Tell me a little bit about the Fed and what they're saying. So, 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 so the, I, I'm a Fed watcher. Like, I don't like discussing Republican and Democrat with people too much anymore, just because it's become it's become too partisan, and people forget about you know big government, small government, and they like root for their team of Republican or Democrat. And it's hard to have dispassionate conversations. It's easier to have dispassionate conversations, I find, with people about monetary policy and what's actually going on in monetary policy. Uh, and I, re- I really enjoy that. So as a lender for a long time, I really watched the Fed. The Fed is actually not a shadow arm of the government. The Fed is like the National Medical Association. Uh, it's a, The National Medical Association is a bunch of doctors deciding the rules by which doctors will play. The teachers unions are a bunch of teachers deciding what a teacher can and can't get away with or should or shouldn't get away with. The Fed is a bunch of bankers deciding the rules by which bankers should play. So uh, and they have oversight authority and they are slightly regulated by the government, but they also not necessarily. They've said two things. The, the U.S. Fed is different than all the other feds of the world. They're called like the Central Bank of England or other things like that. They all the rest of the world's feds have a mandate to fight inflation. Inflation is deadly. Just look at Zimbabwe or Venezuela or, you know, the Weimar Republic. You know, I mean, there's a bunch of different uh, in, in examples of how awful inflation is. So the Fed has a dual mandate, fight inflation and spur economic activity. Our Fed is the only Fed with a dual mandate. And the Fed said this week in its minutes that it is taking the second part of that very seriously. And they are willing to do things that they haven't done before. They are willing to use every tool in their toolbox and get a whole new toolbox if they need to. Yeah, um, They're willing to tie it rate increases to unemployment as opposed to 2% um, inflation, which has been their favorite gauge for a long time. They didn't say they are or aren't going to do that. And there's some Fed members who think they should or shouldn't do that, but they're at least having that conversation. So there's a number of different things that they're going to do. They've also talked about maybe tying raising of interest rates to a specific date. This is huge for the Fed because the Fed is usually seen as a shadowy box that it's hard to get information out of. They release minutes to their to their meetings, but their but their minutes are very cryptic. And what they're going to try and do moving forward is be a whole lot more transparent in what they're saying. That's huge. Um, yeah. And 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 that and, and the fact that the Fed is willing to do what it takes to keep the economy going, and the fact that the Fed is willing to. Um, the fact that the Fed is willing to uh, be more transparent about what it's doing, right. those two things are, are what's helping to buoy the economy. Remember, here's why I like the Fed. They do what's best, not what's politically expedient. And Best for who? Under Great question. So, so here, here's the thing. During the Obama years, the Fed was printing money. They call it quantitative easing, but you and I all know that it was printing money. Yeah. What's the converse? What's the other side of printing money? We print money to keep the economy going. Well, the equivalent of that is quantitative tightening or essentially burning money. Yeah. And during the first three years of of um, Trump, Trump's yeah. time, they didn't, no one ever said this. Like, Trump's numbers were awesome. Trump's numbers would have been freaking ridiculous if the Fed wasn't also burning money. Yeah. Like, Trump was upset that we were only seeing two to three percent to four percent GDP growth. We would have been seeing five, six, or seven percent GDP growth, but the Fed was doing quantitative tightening. So, the Fed, here's what I love about that. The Fed has recently demonstrated their desire to not just print money, but also burn money when they need to in sp- and in the face of a very vocal critic like Donald Trump. OK, so I'm going to I'm going to put a filter on what you just said, or, or not really a filter. I'm going to look through my my sunglasses here and take a look at some other indicators and this is going to be my weekly uh, downer on, on the housing market and the upcoming um, housing market crash. Oh, it's going to get worse. The Fed has said that too, by the way. They've said, mm, this is going to get worse before it gets better. Okay. 
So I read a couple articles this week that got me to the point where I am fairly confident that we are uh, that we're facing some really tough times ahead for both the economy and for housing. Now we talked about. Um, I mean, there's been a bunch of bankruptcies that came out of nowhere that I think uh, bode pretty poorly. Yeah, you were texting me. Who were some of these companies that have recently right. gone bankrupt? Well, it hurts the hurts um, the car the um, car round company hurts. They declare bankruptcy and and they're going through bankruptcy for like the last month, something like that. The the reason why this matters initially, they wanted to file bankruptcy to restructure some of their uh, their leases, the restructure while they weren't getting revenue. Well, the way that their loans are, or excuse me, the way that their leases are structured on these vehicles is that if they stop making the monthly payments on them, right. the creditors come and take the vehicles. And so, you know, if that happens, Hertz is no longer restructuring, they're liquidating. They are right. gone, done, out the door, and a half a million cars Used cars are dumped onto the onto the uh, private market. That's What's more. that going to do to uh, used car sale prices? Right, exactly. Number two, we've got a situation where, well, Pizza Hut and um, uh, okay, Pizza Hut and Wendy's said this week that they're going to be filing for bankruptcy to restructure. Hopefully, to restructure Pizza Hut looks like it's going to happen. Wendy's Pizza not- Hut is a division of PepsiCo, though, right? I, dude, I don't know. I, I know that they used to be. I, who knows if they are anymore? These, you know, they're big conglomerates. But the bottom line here is that Pizza Hut, I mean, like their sales are up, but their income's down. It's pretty bizarre with all of the incentives and well, things. Well, that's that- because, do you know why that is? That's because of Grubhub takes such a uh, a huge percentage you of, of, what, uh, of what, the, what the ticket price is. Right. So you have all of these companies going out of business. Uh, the federal government stated the uh, was talking. Excuse me, I saw something printed regarding these PPP loans. Uh, I don't know if it was the end of last week or beginning of this week. About uh, the projections were that something like twenty five percent of businesses, like across the board, are going to go out of business. Think See, about. I want context on that because what's that? What's the? I mean, I've been an entrepreneur my whole life. Businesses, most businesses fail. Most businesses go out of business. So what's the, you know, 25% compared to what? I don't know if there was a comparison. I think it was more in the context of, hey, look, we're making out, we're making these federal loans to all of these businesses and knowing that 25% of them are going to be out of business. Here's the repercussions to the business owner. And that's a big deal. So here's, here's the biggest issue that I see here. These, these businesses are go are disappearing are going to be disproportionately uh, disproportionate in certain arenas. I mean, let's face it: online orders are up. Online. Oh, so you're saying you're saying not you're not saying you're saying certain industries, not no. necessarily geographic. You're talking about certain yeah. industries are going to be disproportionately affected uh, by by bankruptcies and uh, by bankruptcies and closing down. Exactly. So think about it like this: number one, let's say, let's say hey, let's say you like to go out to eat. It's nice to go out to eat every once in a while, maybe once a week, maybe maybe more frequently. How do you go out to eat when there's no restaurants that are in right. business? Right. How do you get an Uber when Uber doesn't exist? Like some of the things that we be, we have become core parts of our society are going to necessarily disappear because they are because the businesses are not profitable in the short term and there's nobody to prop them up, even right. with federal backing. The second, the, my second reason the housing market's going to crash, right? Uh, second reason is because the Fed is throwing the kitchen sink at everything. They are throwing the kitchen sink at everything. Of course, we have lots of home sales now. People have been pent up during the height of the market, and now they're, they they got to move. They want to move. Ridiculously low interest rates. People have had time to prepare their house because they're working from home. And you've got a lot of decent houses hitting the market. Very low uh, inventory. Lots of people wanting to buy. Great. Yes, prices are up now. But we have a huge wave of unemployment that's coming. And there's good, good unemployment numbers this week. But I think they're a mixed bag. Uh, we'll get into that in a second. But here's the here's the biggest issue or the biggest indicator that I see. Smart money is beginning to position itself to buy distressed assets. You see this with Redfin announced this week that they're going to be entering a few different markets with their iBuyer program. Yeah. Uh, they, they announced this a couple of weeks ago that they were going to be in a few small markets. Now they're extending it to a lot more markets. 
you have uh, th this company Sunday that was started by um, uh, one of the one of the founders and the um, uh, who was he the vice president of of sales for Lending Home and for the guy who was the uh, other CEO or CFO of Airbnb. They got together and they're raising a boatload of cash to buy distressed assets. I mean, these right. aren't stupid people. They can see the writing on the wall and they're putting themselves in a position to buy when things go wrong. And so like, I don't, I don't hope for this. I, I was talking to a, a guy this morning that's a financial planner and he's a, uh, he's an economist as his background. And his take was like, everything's going to be fine because it's going to be, uh, because the Fed's going to step in and pump money in, pump money so, in. Here, it's, uh, yeah, okay. I, I just have a couple, couple quick, 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 quick commentary yeah. points here. So uh, Warren Buffett, Oracle of Omaha, hilariously said, and no one else thought it was hilarious but me, that during, during you know, 2013, like, 2014. Yeah. No, 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 no. It was even before that. Like 2009, 2010, he yeah. said, if I could buy 100,000, and he had the cash to do it, he said, if I could buy 100,000 single-family homes in the United States right now, I would. I just can't figure out how to do property management. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's the problem. Yeah. Um, and so so he decided basically not to do that. BlackRock. Here's a funny thing. Look at look at the countries of the world and look at assets under management for BlackRock. And if they're if you compare their countries to if you compare their assets under management to like GDPs of countries, yeah, it's like they would be the seventh biggest country in the world or eighth biggest country in the world. It's something something stupid like that. Yeah. Um, and I know assets under management isn't directly a connection to GDP because the one's an annual figure and the other one's, you know, whatever. The point is BlackRock is ridiculously huge, hasn't been around for 300 years, has only been around since the 80s. Yeah. BlackRock did not make money when they tried this. Now, yes, they made three to 4% or five to 7%, depending on how you do the numbers. You're talking about buying single family homes? Yeah. You're wrong. When you they, when you look at inflation and when you look at the at the at the at what they you look at what what the inflation was during the hold period and you look at actually putting a real opportunity cost on the money that they deployed, I believe that BlackRock could have made more money other ways and and basically lost money on all the single family homes. They they doubled their their investment in three years. They personally they BlackRock themselves invested a billion dollars of their own capital and made more than $3 billion on that $1 billion investment for themselves and their shareholders. They also raised an additional several billion dollars in private capital. So may, I, I mean, I'm telling you, BlackRock, they did it absolutely right. Like that's that was that was gonna. Follow. I need to look at these numbers again. It's been two years since I've looked at them. I just remember thinking, ah, BlackRock made a mistake there. Oh, and and maybe it, maybe it's not as much as they're making on other investments, but I mean on the single single family, like they were they networked with so many stinking wholesalers, it was ridiculous. They did a really great job. They cut yeah, out. I knew I know a bunch of guys down in Philly uh, who were who were working for and with BlackRock and and things like that. I Uber on nights and weekends. Do you know that? Yeah. For fun, um, I, I I drove around a couple of BlackRock guys on, on a number of occasions, and it was uh it was it was, all, it was funny. It was like picking up a bunch of people from boiler room. It was like that type of young kid mentality. Yep. They're young and dumb, making stupid money and doing stupid things with their money, and they think that because like the senior 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 VPs are making good moves, um, that that, that and, oh, there's just so much money trickling down to them that they that they know and understand finance. It's hilarious. Yeah. All right. So we didn't cover UFOs. We'll we get are, to UFOs. Listen, uh, this is a, this is a little longer than our typical. Josh needs no help to talk about UFOs. <laughs> All right. You know, you know, you know what Josh's problem with UFOs is? He doesn't think they're unidentified. He knows exactly what they are. <laughs> Here's what I do know. He's not disagreeing, not. folks. He's not disagreeing with me. <laughs> Unemployment. Good news is. Unemployment dropped to uh, what? 11.1% uh, in June. Ridiculously good numbers on unemployment. On the surface. Okay. So th this is this is the, my, my caveat here. We're already seeing it in Pennsylvania that all of a sudden we have these higher COVID numbers 
And even though death rates aren't changing, people are freaking out. And so Florida, Texas, Arizona, California, these open uh, economies are getting closed back down. Right. And just when you thought we were going to get out of it, they it's like, come it's like it's like, uh, it's like uh, what's the line from uh, Godfather Three? Every time I think I'm out, they drag me back. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. I mean, look, there were really big gains in June, um, and a lot of these numbers are a couple weeks old, so they don't even show the the impact of these reclosures, and right. that's a big deal. Um, we saw lots of gains in leisure, hospitality. Um, health and wellness and uh, education and retail. So, I mean, th- it's what you would expect when the economy opens back up. People want to go out to eat. They want to go and travel. They want to do this and that. If if we can continue to stay open, I think there's some promise there. Does Taz have a copy of our show notes? No, I put it on the description. UFOs. Come oh, on. Oh, okay. Gotcha. I was going to say, like, I'm looking ahead. Like, what do we got? I mean, we we'll probably go for another five to 10 minutes here. Maybe. What are we going to talk about? What should we pull out? And I see UFOs. I'm like, I didn't see that when I first looked at things. How does, how does Taz know that we're uh, we're going to talk about that? All right. Talk about Elon Musk. Why is Elon Musk oh my the gosh. man? He just continues to be the man. I mean, this is right. the third or fourth time we brought him up in conversation. Who do you like more? I mean, so far today we're praising uh, Zuck and Elon Musk. If we were going to do like a college basketball bracket, uh, who's better, uh, Zuck or Elon Musk? How's that for a question? Look, uh, uh, let's. This is the kind of award that you can only get once. So he already got it for blasting some people in the space. Absolutely, absolutely. We're gonna let Zuck have his turn, but we're not gonna stop talking about Elon. What did Elon do that's so great? All right. So Tesla is now the most valuable car company in the world. They right. just surpassed Toyota, right. and uh, I mean it's pretty amazing. The guy is continually pushing the ball. They've never turned a profit. They've never made, they've never sold an individual car for a profit and they've never actually profited as a company. Wait, did they have a profitable quarter or two? Yeah, they did. last year. They did. You're right. You're right. You're right. Yeah. But so here's the big problem. There's something like what, 150,000, 150 or 103,000 vehicles sold in the first quarter. Yet, Toyota sold 2.4 million during the same time frame, and uh, Tesla is valued at um, uh, has a market cap rate higher than Toyota. I mean, so the total value of their shares out there is higher than you know Honda, Ferrari, BMW, GM. You know, I mean, you name it, um, all of them combined, together. not individually. Oh, and, and Nissan. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. And Nissan, right. I forgot Nissan. Combined. And like, I'm a Ferrari guy. You know what I mean? So yeah, that's a, uh, that's an interesting, uh, that's an interesting statistic there. Here's, here's what's so cool about Tesla doing what they're doing when they're doing it is it's hard to get cutting edge technology right and have the market like it. You know what I mean? Like yeah. long before iPad, iPods came out, which yep. was the precursor to the smartphone and the precursor to the iPad. Uh, Microsoft came out with the Zoom or Zoom or whatever it was, and they just missed the marketing a little bit on it. And it was also just, you know, three years too soon. Yeah. Um, turns out Apple did it better, different, bigger, better, faster, more, and it hit. I think it's funny that Tesla is doing all this really cool stuff with futuristic technology the same time that um, what are those scooters? Segways finally, you know, packs its bags up and goes home. Segways are, you know, they about a month or two ago they've uh, they they closed their doors. So yep. it just goes to show that just because something's cool, just because something's interesting, just because it's something something's awesome, doesn't mean that the market is going to love it. So what Tesla's doing is with a number of different things. And they're doing awesome, cool stuff that the market is also liking. You know what's really interesting about Tesla? So in uh, in with the 2008 um, crisis, they did something really smart. They realized that there was not going to be a better time for them to really just go all in 
because they could get a government loan with at zero percent interest for like a quarter billion or a half a billion dollars because they were an alternative um, fuel source, right? right? They took that and doubled down, and really that that's one of the things that allowed them to really propel themselves forward. Where a lot of these other companies that took these loans and, and grants, they just took the money and went out of business. You know, I mean, it, it's it, it's incredible when you have the technology there and you're able to get the funding. And, and the the marketing's right, and the personality's right, and you've got the right operator. Like it's a it's a hard thing to make all of those things come together all at one time. All right, let's talk about Hong Kong. <laughs> I mean, I don't even know if that's the most pressing. Hong Kong, holy cow! It is the most pressing. There's more billionaires in Hong Kong than there is in New York City. There were last I, week, right? So that's 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 the point. Like, I mean, there are Hong Kong. It is basically, I mean, in this, in the, in the wealth that's there, in the size of the city, in how it is a economic hub for that whole hemisphere. Yeah, Hong Kong was. I got to tell you, it's just, it's just frightening. The crazy thing is, too, like the the, the Union Jack came down in '97. There are people alive today who remember. British rule and are now under communist rule. Right. I mean, it can happen fast. It can happen here in America. It can happen, you know, when 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 Marxism is on the move, it it does not take generations yeah. to happen. We are always one generation away from serfdom. So, just so you know, if if you don't know what's going on in Hong Kong, essentially the um, the communist Chinese government. They had agreed during this transition from, uh, you know, a, a British colony to, uh, you know, to Chinese control that they were going to keep the market open, that they were going to keep it a democratic and, you know, economically focused region that was going to be much different than the rest of mainland China. Well, that hasn't happened. They recently passed some um, regulations and implemented those regulations to really tamp down on anybody that is showing any kind of resistance. It's a big problem um, for that city because it's, I mean, the U.S. has already responded to it. We we uh, took them out of, what it, what do they call it? Um, special trade status. Yeah. Hong Kong is no longer, uh, no longer has special trade status with the U.S. We stopped uh, shipping defense equipment to Hong Kong. Um, and generally speaking, like, Taiwan's next. A lot of people don't realize that when, you know, when when the commies took over China, the 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 government that was there went and basically set up a, a government in exile in Taiwan. Yeah. And 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 like during the Clinton years, there was like some scuffles between China and Taiwan. And I mean, like chi what China is doing right now with Hong Kong, I think we're going to see in Taiwan next. I think that there are other places in the South China yeah. Sea where we are just going to continue to see China uh, exert its dominance. Well, the, the problem is we have a defense treaty with Taiwan, right? Which is which is actually called the Republic of China, um, right? That's what that's the, that's the funny thing is like we call them Taiwan just to like to be polite to the to to, to mainland China, but Taiwan refers to itself as we are not the People's Republic of China. That's what those commies are. We're the Republic of China. We're real China. We're just here in exile. That's right. That's right. So, I mean, it's, it, history is really interesting. It, it, it lays out the future really well. <laughs> All right. I think the last thing we got to talk about, I'm, I'm looking over my notes here, and the last thing on the list, UFOs, baby. UFOs. All right. So we talked about this briefly in, back in April when this was uh, originally posted, but the Navy came out and and posted uh, three videos or four videos of these unidentified flying objects, do, you know, defying um, the uh, the rules of physics, doing these crazy maneuvers, and some really prominent people have been coming out and saying, "Hey, maybe we ought to take a, another look at this. Is this, you know, where are these things coming from? What are they?" and and do some scientific research. Right. Well, and it's kind of scary because, um, you know, the, the joke that everybody's made that I'm going to go ahead and make as well is, you know, what does it say about 2020 when the Navy's saying, yeah, by the way, we've been lying to you for 50 years. UFOs are really real. Uh, it's like, yeah, you're great. We got like three stories ahead of that. 
Not like it's not like we'll use it as a filler or whatever. We have three stories ahead of that. Bottom of the stack. We like, almost didn't get to it today. Right. right? We, we we doubled our airtime today and we almost didn't get to the fact that oh, maybe there really are UFOs. That's right. That's right. So look, um, do you think they're UFOs or do you think like here's the thing? Here's the thing, man. Yeah. Like so I'm an aviation nut. My grandfather flew P-38s out of North Africa in the Second World War. Yeah. I love skydiving and I love all things, you know, aviation. The F-22 Raptor, that's a mean freaking bird, dude. Like the F-22 Raptor, the things that it can do. By the way, like, so let's say, let's say you're like this, right? And the F-22 Raptor is ahead of you. It can do a full spin in its airspace, shoot a missile at you, and then keep on going. Yeah. Like within its air, its own airspace, it can do a 360, get target lock, shoot a missile, and then keep on going. Who knows what we're experimenting on right now? That's what we were developing in the 80s and 90s. Who knows what we're working on right now? All right. I got two comments on that. Number one. I could totally see a situation where there are being what Russia's working on right now. You know what I mean? Who knows what I'm not even saying that I'm saying like, I think it, it is realistic to say that we don't know everything about our planet and certainly not about the planets that surround us and whether they're habitable, not habitable, whether beings live there, whether those those life forms even can create a spaceship and come here and all that stuff. I, I read something the other day that something like 95% of the oceans, we have no idea what they contain, right? That, that in and of itself is a pretty good indicator that we only know about 5% of the area of the earth that is, it contains what, two thirds of, two thirds of the area of the earth we only know 5% about. All right. That's the first thing. Second thing is, I had a client that uh, the guy, he is a military officer, um, and his job was to negotiate and sign contracts with um, government contractors, right? And uh, I heard once that government technology is 40 years ahead of, of mainstream, you know, retail public technology. And I asked him about it. And he looked and he kind of like looked away and he was, it's like he was doing some calculations in his head. And he's like, yeah, that's about right. So I don't think that that's unrealistic. You know, right. I mean, in the 19, 1980 is 40 years ago, like very, very likely that there is some technology that we know nothing about. That's pretty far ahead of what we had. You know, I mean, shoot, look at 10 years ago. My gosh. My favorite military story is my brother, Jason, when he was going over to uh, play in the sandbox. So uh, they like give him, uh, you know, injection. And they're like, and, and Jason's like a curious dude, just like I am. And so they give him this injection. They're like, what's that? He's like, that's a tetanus shot. What's that? That's a TB booster. You know, you're going into parts of the world where tuberculosis is still a very real thing. You know, we need to give you a tuberculosis shot. What's that? That one's classified. What's that? That one's a booster shot for the classified shot. Wait, <laughs> what? He's like, yeah, I can't tell you what that is. He's like, that's my arm. He's like, no, it's not. That arm belongs to the U.S. Marine Corps. We're allowed to inject whatever we want in that arm and not tell you. Yeah. Yeah. So, like, and, 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 like, I know that my brother Jason knew a whole bunch of classified stuff. You know what I mean? That, like, you're, like, we were talking about howitzers one time. And he's like, you know, we have, we have, like, howitzers that shoot. And also, like, we've got ones that'll shoot and then they're, like, rocket assisted. Like, they'll go even further than that. And he's like, well, there's the cla there's the unclassified range, but the classified range is actually a lot further than that. I can't say. He's like, the, the unclassified range is they'll shoot 26 miles. The unclassified range is actually a lot further than that. Right. Right. Exactly. So, uh, who knows? It's interesting. I think it's it's interesting to speculate. It's fun to speculate. You know, little green men running around our planet it would be kind of interesting to. Uh, we should we should we should get our boy um, Steve on here to talk about this because he's a uh, you know full full uh, bird colonel. Uh, oh yeah, years, um, yeah. You know, in in the army, he would he would. Uh, well, actually, we shouldn't get on here talking about this. We should go out for some adult refreshment uh, with him sometime at the end of the week and uh, and pick his brain on what his thoughts are on all this. 
That's it. Awesome. All right. So we're going to end it with UFOs today. Great news day. Jam packed. Tomorrow, tomorrow we're going to go one through 10, uh, the Bill of Rights, why we think they're important as our uh, 4th of July send off. I love doing business on and around the 4th of July and on and around um, September 11th. Um, God bless America. I think this is the greatest, richest, freest country on earth. Uh, yep. If you can't make it here, uh, it's your fault. Uh, suck it up and stop being um, playing the victim card. There is plenty wrong with America, but there is so much more right with America than there is wrong with it. And at least acknowledge all the amazing things that are right with it before you start talking about the things that we need to change. Beautiful. All right. If you love the video, if you like the video, like and share. We'll see you back here tomorrow at noon. And uh, if you're not going to be here, have a fantastic Fourth of July, Independence Day, and we'll uh, we'll see you tomorrow. God bless America, everybody. See ya.